right, folks, we're back with another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. And tonight we're actually uh, recording this a little bit differently. We actually have some live guests at the house. Uh, we have Kirk and Jim from Miniature Building Authority. And, of course, I have my two dogs in the background that uh, just seem to love Jim over here so much. So, so much. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we're going to hope that they're not going to be too much of a distraction tonight. And this is actually going to be a little bit different because of the fact that we actually have some video representation that will go along with this as long as my dogs cooperate. So, <laughs> guys, how are you doing tonight? Doing right. well. Doing right. well. Yeah. Appreciate the invite. Awesome. Awesome. And, of course, as usual, I am joined by my co-host, Nick, who will be over on his side, uh, just kind of listening in and painting and throwing in comments here and there, wherever he chooses to uh, do so. Hi. Yeah, great. Way, way to be uh, enthusiastic. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, I see all this cool stuff on the other side of the screen, so, you know, it makes me a little sad. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. We're, we're going to get to that. So tonight... Uh, as I said, we're joined by Miniature Building Authority. Now, they are known in the hobby industry for making probably some of the best damn resin terrain that has ever come out on the market. And uh, I would, I after seeing a lot of their stuff, I'm still going to say that hands down, they are probably the most diverse company out there when it comes time to resin terrain. And uh, I've seen their stuff more than any other company on the market. So, guys, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got Miniature Building Authority started? some of your first products, kind of like some of your pitfalls along the way and your process to get to where you are now. All right. Well, well I started, I, uh, I used to own the war room here in uh, Atlanta area quite a few years, and I've always been uh, fascinated with terrain. And I wanted to find uh, a person that could make some terrain. And I had one guy working on it. It didn't work out the way I wanted it to. And one day uh, this guy shows up with his son while he's playing in a magic tournament. And we got to talking for over the next, what, six, eight hours. <laughs> that was the ride for my 14-year-old son and his buddy at a tournament. So, so we just stuck up a friendship. And uh, Jim, being a professional model maker, can make anything, not only in miniature, but especially in miniature, which has been uh, fantastic. His designs are, and capabilities are, are really, really exceptional. Awesome. So how long ago did you guys get started? Uh, it'll be 15 years, basically, this summer. Uh, the, yeah. uh, the first products were released in September of 2002. Wow. Wow. And what were the first products? Uh, if we initially had a, um, um, a, a seminal breakthrough moment, it was actually that afternoon. Uh, Kirk knew he wanted to do pre-painted, assembled buildings with removable roofs and removable, removable interior floors. So he had that part figured out. What he didn't really have was a product line of what to do. And so he showed me a bunch of stuff that was being made by other companies and this and that. And again, I had eight hours to kill. So I flipped through every catalog he had and all this kind of stuff. And the standard look for most everything at that time was medieval Tudor buildings to do this and do that. But everybody's catalog at that time was very much um, dispersed and uh, um, not particularly very coherent. And I realized that what everybody really wanted was an entire village with a unified look where you'd walk up and you would see a village on the table and go, that's it. That's my game right there. And right. so uh, over the next couple of uh, months, we came up with 11 products, um, a bridge, a church, several different buildings, a market building, a little of this, a little of that, and uh, 11 different designs. And I made prototypes for them and uh, we sent them off to be uh uh, bid for casting and manufacturing and everything like that. And um, then the, the initial release of those 11 products was in the September of 2002. And very shortly after that, November of 2002, at uh, the first convention, we were really offering them for sale. Um, uh, one of our first real customers walked up and said, I love them. How much? We said, well, which ones? They said, no, all of it. And so I was right. He wanted the village and we sold hundreds of the village just like that all 11 pieces discount price but the whole village many other people of course bought this one building at a time so we sold villages all at once yeah that's amazing because i know that most of the time for terrain um it, honestly it wasn't up until mdf kits started coming out that a lot of people would pick up like a piece here a piece there they kind of got what they could afford at the time. And yeah. again, like you were saying, like so much of it was so dispersed across the board that somebody might do a castle really well, or somebody might do this one Tudor building really well, but they didn't, 
you had to go elsewhere for so much of it and kind of right. piecemeal it together. And sometimes it's like, yeah, it's cool. You have all this terrain, but it doesn't look cohesive. Right. Right. Well, and not just because you're buying it from different companies in general, but those companies, as we've seen over the years, they come and go. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I mean, uh, we may not be the senior company in the business at this point, but we don't have too many peers left. Um, they just come and go. The other thing is we enjoy resin. As a gamer, both role player and a miniature gamer, I like the feel and the look that you get out of resin buildings. You can't do that with MDF. You cannot, no. And um, we're going to continue to do. That's our. That's what we do. And um, I just, that's what really, and there's a lot of other people who really appreciate resin over MDFs. So, and being pre-painted, pre-assembled was huge in the market. And... Um, it was those people, most people that are getting older uh, don't have enough time to game, let alone build something, paint it on top of their armies that they got to do. So as Jim always says, who has time to paint buildings? Yeah, there's no glory in painting buildings. There's, I've never no. seen painted buildings as a category in a painting contest or anything. No, if anything, it's always stuck on. It's like... Um like a diorama piece, like it's just one building maybe in the that, background, yeah, you know, maybe that. that. And really that was Warhammer Fantasy that really did that. Outside of that, I can't think of any games that right. really judged your your tournament base on your, even your painted models. No, 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 down. Sorry, folks, again, dogs. <laughs> Why don't you go sit over there? Yeah, go lay down, go lay down. All right, so after the, uh, the, the village took off and did really well, where did you guys go from there? Well, we reinforced that that series was called the Euro Village, and it's still around. Uh, there's only one piece of the original 11 that's still in production. That would be the bridge. Uh, but we continued to add to that for probably the first year, and then we expanded that out into the countryside with farm buildings and, and such like that. And then... Uh, well, at the same time, we also brought in some accessories. Yes, yes, carts and wagons and barrels and crates and things like that. And then... Um, the natural expansion from that was the Castle Town Wall series. Again, part of the same look, the same technology and everything like that, but a uh, modular castle system where you get to design your own dream castle and we just sell you a big pile of boxes and you put it together however you want to put it together for any particular game. So you, you mentioned your technology. What, what do you guys do in order to produce the products? I, I know a lot of people when they think of resin buildings, they think of like your your rubber molds that somebody had to build the master, then pour it, and then depending upon how that goes, there's eight or nine different rubber molds they have to pour into. Well, traditionally, the way I explain it is that I make an original model out of whatever materials are appropriate to make that model out of, whether it's actually uh, wood, uh, MDF uh, um, structure with popsicle stick glued all over the outside of it, and little shingles and everything like that, or in the case of this building here, it's a special kind of foam, high-density foam. Uh, um, most of the model-making techniques are we're basically woodworking commercial model-making techniques. And then I paint the original model, make it exactly the way I want the finished prototype to work, and we would send it off to the manufacturer, and they had a magic cloning machine and spit out little white boxes with barcodes and photographs and, and, and uh, clamshell styrofoam on the inside. I don't have a clue how to make a mold out of some of that stuff. Fantastic. So it involves a magic mold. <laughs> exactly. So, okay. so Chinese. Yeah, Chinese. Awesome. Now, the thing is, from a business standpoint, uh, there is a, a large entry barrier for a lot of companies, and that's worked well for us in the fact that you have to buy, buy the container. Yeah. So uh, most companies just can't do that. We've been fortunate enough to be able to do that. Uh, downside is we do have to warehouse all those products, which you know all about. <laughs> yes, warehousing <laughs> is a pain in the ass. So, um, but it uh, gives us um, the flexibility to be able to do them pre-painted, pre-assembled, ready to go right out of the box. It's much more difficult to do that if you're doing, um, you know, where you're casting it yourself. It's, uh, we're doing more products stateside um, but those are not the same as the ones done in China. They don't have the packaging, and they're usually not painted. Because um, the, that's what the Chinese specialize in, and they do a really good job. Fantastic. Awesome. 
So you guys moved on to the farm side. Um, you, you've got your technique down. You guys have branched off yes. so, so, so far yes. on so many things. You've actually have a back catalog. If you go onto the Ministry of Building Authority website, there's actually a back catalog of stuff. They're like, hey, look how cool this is. Too bad, so sad. We no longer make it anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, People complain about that, but we also have people that want to know what was produced. So right. it's, you know. But it's the nature of having to buy a shipping container of something. So for instance, the science fiction series, we did uh, six pieces in the science fiction series. And it didn't really take off, but we had hundreds of those sitting around and it took years to sell them all off. Well, they're not going to come back. Right. And the same thing with the, uh, the Americana series, the Civil War series, for whatever reason, they just didn't really catch on the way that, say, the Euro Village and the other series have. Um, different history than that would be the High Adventure series or the Spanish Main series, which when we brought those out, um, there was a again, a coherent system. You had like seven or eight pieces. You look at it and you go, well, there's an entire game. Here are all the pieces you need to run a particular adventure right there. And people bought kind of the whole set all at once. And then when we did it right, we satisfied the pent up demand for that series just about the time we ran out of them. Fantastic. Okay. And the people will call us and they want this. And again, they say, well, we got to wait, got to wait, you know, it may be five, 10 years and there'll be a new pent up generation of people that need that. Uh, so, um, that is another um, history line that some of those special edition series, they're just that. There may be a limited edition special series yeah. that comes out once ever because we filled up the market. 2008, when the High Adventure series came out, we were trying something new. We didn't know how it was going to work. So part of the selling point was that uh, on a few of the big re releases for that uh, new expansion, we told everybody up front, these are limited edition one time runs, get them now or you will never see them again. And uh, the old old, old, temple. old temple, which is very Cthulhu esque looking, um, and we did a lovely um, river, trading, river post. trading post. Thank you, Jim. And full interiors on both, just fabulous pieces. They both sold out before they even got here. <laughs> <laughs> Business 101 so, in this industry, if you can get it to sell out before it even hits the States, you're doing great. <laughs> so uh, that was really exciting. And uh, we followed up with a few more things. And we kind of changed how we did limited editions so that uh, in the future, like uh, Jepson's Jungle Hideaway Bar, which is kind of that sleazy little bar where you can get your last gin and tonic before you head off into the jungle. Um, that I love was, that building. Uh, originally brought out, we said it was going to be limited edition, but we said that we're going to have an option to do a second run, and then that will be it. And we did do that. So um, that's probably the, well, you know, everything that we do is limited edition. Right. It really, really is. People don't think about it, but we're doing anywhere between 80 on the low end to about 600 on the high end in a given run. <clears throat> and we may or may not do them again. So uh, if people have an interest in it, they, they need to grab those while they can. But that's the nature of almost anything. I mean, right. 2017 Camaros are limited edition because at some point they're going to switch to 2018 Camaros and you won't be able to get a 2017 new Camaro. Right. At least not from the manufacturer. Right. You have to find it elsewhere. Right. Awesome. So you guys, again, diversified your product line, and I know that, was it last year, the year before, you guys started on doing some Kickstarters? Yeah, we did. That was 2014 was our first Kickstarter. Okay, 2014. And that was our Castle Kickstarter, which we thought was very successful. It did about 146000 which for toy castles, I thought was pretty good. Um, and since then, we've... Uh, We've just following with everybody else. That is the model that you have to do now to bring out new products. There's just too much money involved. Not doing, I mean, when our containers cost fifty to seventy-five thousand a piece, that's a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I get it. Yeah, um, you have, you got to do a Kickstarter, and Kickstarters are are uh, a lot of fun. I enjoy doing them and putting them together. And Jim does great models. So Kickstarters are a big part of our model right now. Then we also do. We branched off probably about four years ago, direct, um, 
we, to be honest, we just got tired of being undercut on the internet by other people. <clears throat> and that's how it goes when you're, when you retail your product and distribute your product, it's the nature of the business. So we came up with a direct line of, of terrain, we call it. And this is done domestically for the most part. And it is mostly unpainted. And this gives us options to do a lot of little accessories where maybe I don't want to do 500 of them at a time from China, but I can do them locally for 40 or 50 at a time. And then uh, we can go through them a lot easier and then uh, easier restocks on those kind of things. And we started doing furniture initially. Then we started doing little outside accessory kind of things. Um, and then we've worked with other companies too. Uh, are you familiar with Litco? Yes. Litco on uh, several of our larger buildings did some interiors for us, which was really cool. That worked out really well. And um, <clears throat> we started progressing. And then one day we just started messing around. We were doing, uh, what, what, what brought us into that? The newest expansion, Shanty stuff. What was that? We were doing something. We were making the Middle Eastern... Middle Eastern has been a really big set for us along with the Euro Village. So right now the Euro Village and the Middle Eastern are probably our biggest um, product lines. And we started coming up with uh, some, we were doing some shanties just to show off some uh, some displays. And I said, well, for, Jim's going to put all this work into them. Let's produce them and see how they do. And we kind of stumbled into doing a shanty town is our, is our next expansion. So we already have about 10 products in Shantytown right now. And um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been crazy. You can think about all those crazy little things and, uh, and Jim can put them out and, and you can do it. And so we decided that uh, <clears throat> the next Kickstarter, we, you know, we've got to bat around and got to come up with new ideas all the time. So the next Kickstarter is going to be our Shantytown. So we're taking that and we've gotten 35 new products or more are coming out uh, probably late summer. They're all at the uh, production facility right now, uh, so we can get prototypes back. These will be uh, direct trains, so they won't necessarily be painted, but we've contracted with a with a guy who's going to painting service who will offer to paint them. And I got you know we still got to work out all those prices and everything, but so you will have the option to have them painted if you want. Sure, um, but it's been a lot of fun. And just coming up with crazy things for this thing. Yes. <clears throat> the, the more awful, the better. Open sewers and, and <laughs> dead donkeys and all kinds of just it's, it's almost <laughs> the worst thing you can think of, the better, the more likely people look at it. Well, I mean, when you're talking at shanty town, you want it to be dirty and grungy. Yeah, and exactly. Just like exactly. So, all over the place. so this is pretty much, now this is a new one coming out, but this is the new small shanty. Right. And what, Jim, what size is this? What, three by? It's probably two by three. Two by three. All right. So for you folks listening, um, you can, if you join our Patreon, you can actually see this video. Um, we're actually going to have these up on a video that you guys can all see. But uh, yeah, he they did bring some of the new buildings along to show off. So that way, uh, while we're talking, we'll try to describe them as best as possible. But in order to get the full effect, definitely check out the video. Yeah. So this is kind of it. You know, your shanty town is going to be typically made of found products. So we do a lot of sheet metal. Corrugated sheet metal. Corrugated sheet metal, textured uh, plastic panels, old scraps of plywood, things like that. And then whatever you can on top, you just do all sorts of things. This is uh, one of the earlier ones. This is the water shanty. Um, again, the roofs come off on all these, and they do have some of them have interiors. Um, some of them are just black on the inside, but um, give you kind of example. These little silly shanty walls, these are three inches long. And these have been, gosh, we sold probably three or 400 of these already. Every bit. Yeah. Wow. It's just, it's it's unique. You could use these anywhere from uh, moderns to post-apocalyptic to zombie apocalypse. Yep. And all those kind of things are really kicking off right now. Yep. Um, in, the, in the movies, I, I, just coincidental movies I've been watching, uh, there are shanty towns that look kind of like this for the last hundred years, almost every every place in the world. Um, and doing research for shanties, some of them are in, in extremely unlikely places, and they're not real big, but just uh, buildings made out of found objects 
are, uh, are just a standard thing. And so um, today I was finishing up another shanty. Uh, that'll be part of the Kickstarter, part of a, a future Kickstarter release. Kickstarter 2. We're Kickstarter already planning two, on yeah. Kickstarter 2. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, it takes Jim a year ahead, roughly, to plan out to get everything ready to go. Gotcha. So um, what we're doing right now will be for the summer of 2018. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Perfect. So this was another fun one. We got back a prototype from um, our producer. What I'm trying to do is get like three or five, three to five of each right out of the run so we can paint some up and show you what they're going to look like. Um, it's all about sales. You're going to sell more when that happens. This is the clinic, and it has a full interior. So, yeah, if you want to hold it up to the camera right up there. So, folks, for you listening at home, um, it does have a full interior. The roof comes off, and it looks like there's uh, three rooms in there. Uh, yeah, there's three rooms, and this does come with. Oh shoot, popped off. This one didn't want to come out very easy. This comes with your medical exam furniture. So there's Up your exam bit. table, the doctor's uh, little um, table, Desk. and a little uh, uh, trash can where you put the needles kind of things. Nice. Yeah. No, it's awful. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's nice for me as a guy who likes blood stuff. In the floor in there? Yes, yeah, the blood stains. <laughs> in the floor. But then Jim started going crazy and researching uh, graffiti, um, so he has just gone crazy on this thing, and I just love it. It just uh, it just pops when you put it on the table. Yeah, it's it definitely has a very very uh, well lived in look, especially with the graffiti on the side. It looks like it's been there for ages. Well, we think part of shanty town like this is the old commercial district from 50, 60 years ago. It's just gotten seedier and seedier. And <laughs> so, yeah, a few of the buildings are just on their last legs. This is the police station. And um, really like it as well. And uh, you can pop it open. It comes with a government standard issue office set with metal desk and chair, <laughs> filing cabinet and um wall locker and then Excellent. it does have an interior as well it has the jail cell so you can put your uh, miniatures in there so you have to you know get bust your buddies out of jail it even comes with a counter on the front with donuts on the front for all the police to enjoy we're doing uh like jim said more the the business side of shanty town so we have things like a garage mechanic shop which is junk piled everywhere <clears throat> we have a little building that we're calling the internet cafe um which i'm really liking just because you can when all those missions where you either got to go there to get your mission or you got to go there to send out the message or whatever so many fun things you can do with that right um we have a little bank uh, it comes with a safe, probably has $5 in it. <laughs> we have a... Not the point. There's money in there. <laughs> That's right. It's an objective. You know, it's all about the objectives of these things. Um, There's a warehouse. Yeah, warehouse, a dive bar, furniture for all this stuff. Lots um, of accessories. Yeah. Lots of accessories. Yeah. Little scooters, street and food vendors. Um, Open air meat market. A chemistry Butcher lab shop. that looks suspiciously like they make crystal meth, but <laughs> we're not saying that. <laughs> So all the fun things with this, and uh, I'm just really, really excited. Everybody that sees it is um, wanting it right now, so it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I have to admit, when I saw your table set up at uh, the CMON Expo a few weeks ago, first thing I thought is, wow, they really improved on this set to the point where I was like, I want to do just like military games all over this thing all the time. Like that was <laughs> that was my first thought, and of course, then when I go there, they've got military figures running across the table. I'm like, okay. Well, what is this and what are we playing? Last year, we came out with our own line of modern uh, U.S. Army figures uh, sculpted by Bobby Jackson. They are excellent figures, 28 millimeter. And we did a opposing uh, forces unit of generic AK-47 wielding beret paramilitary kind of guys. And so uh, it's nice having your own figures. And then uh, we're doing uh, uh, trucks later this year as well. I got that project going on as well. So we're taking modern do uh, two and a half ton and five ton army trucks, and we'll have seven of those coming out, plus the joint light tactical vehicle, which will all be this summer as well. That'll probably be, it'll either be part of this Kickstarter or a separate Kickstarter. I don't know yet um, when all that's going to happen. Awesome. Uh, got a lot of moving pieces going on right now, but 
uh, we're doing that. And then uh, we got, yeah, we got a lot of projects still going right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're trying to work with the Chinese. Uh, we got some other project that's ready to go. We just got to get the Chinese back, uh, have a powwow with them, get them online so we can be doing a, should we talk about that one? Or? Yeah, yeah. Talk about yeah that we'll one. do that one next time. All right. <laughs> So we've already got some. We already got some stuff planned for next time. <laughs> There's always stuff for next time. Yeah. <laughs> so, and if anybody has any good ideas or bad ideas for Shanty Town, we are completely open. Jim's going to be doing uh, things. Gosh, like a, a shanty refugee, on a barge. Yeah, yeah, listing kind of thing. Yeah. Nice yeah, refugee vehicle piled it. high with all sorts of crap on it and stuff like that. So, yeah, <laughs> so. just more and more and more stuff. I mean, we go to a convention or or just. A 10 hour drive in the car from here to Lancaster, Pennsylvania for a convention, you get a lot of ideas. Um, yeah, I can imagine. And so I carry a little pocket notebook with me everywhere and I just fill it up with ideas and they all go on a big master list. And that doesn't necessarily mean they'll become a product, but sometimes they cluster and two or three of these ideas will become a little group product. And so we never throw any ideas out. Nice, nice. So obviously the focus right now is on the business district of the shanty town and getting that all up. Oh, there's, there's, there are more, um, res there are more residential shanties too. I mean, okay. altogether we've got seven or eight residential shanties. Yeah. And there's two or three the time the time so we can perfect. Perfect. So with, with the set that you're doing, is it pretty much going to be land-based? I know you have one that is a water base, but do you have like two different themes that will be happening? That, that's a them? great question because what we're thinking right now, is Shanty Town the Kickstarters? You're right. It's going to be mainly the district bringing in what businesses you find in the area. But we're already talking about Shanty Town, the waterfront, or something like that. Sure, to include perhaps an alternate version of this, even a two-story version of this. Yeah. Uh, shanty on a barge, and then as soon as we get on that roll, other Jeez. ideas will start falling in place. Yeah. And you you said that normally it takes about a year to crack them out. Well, from the time from the time I green light the idea in my head. To the time that it ends up as a product in your hands can yeah it could be a year okay because it, it may take six months uh for the uh, even a domestic caster yeah to go through all the process felicity likes the idea too apparently all right hey now <laughs> uh the joys of having giant dogs folks so as, as far as uh some of the product that will be coming out on the kickstarter why don't we talk about that a little bit what exactly is the kickstarter going to be launching we get uh, at Historicon, we'll pick up the pro well, the plan is we're picking up the rest of the prototypes. Okay. So another 30, 30 pieces thereabouts. In about a month. <clears throat> yeah. So when that happens, we will take those and then <clears throat> what we're doing is Jim paints some of those, which just we're going to get those are going to be the teaser models, get you excited about it, all that kind of stuff. And the guy who's actually painting the sets that you get in the Kickstarter. We're going to want him to paint a set so we can show you what you're going to be getting during the Kickstarter. So, yeah, we'll pick up all those items and then uh, we'll start pricing them. And then, you know, that's where I kind of kick in. I'll, I'll, Jim does all the design work and he's excellent. As you can see, he's excellent what he does. What I do on the other side of it is the business side. I put together the Kickstarters. I'll put together the, the pledges, figure out what we're going to do, what the pricing is going to be on that stuff. The groupings. And, yeah. Um, the problem is when you get to 35 pieces, putting together a Kickstarter because you really don't want a whole lot of pledge levels. Right. You, you also it. don't want to have a bunch of stuff where, where you have the potential of it unlocking or not unlocking. And then you're stuck with all this product. You're like, well, we were really hoping we got this unlocked, but it's already kind of done. Well, I got to tell you, we're going to do, we, we, we kind of did that with our first Kickstarter in 2014 where products would unlock as they went along and really people don't like that <laughs> no they would much rather see it all just like right up front can i buy this as either an extra or is this part of yes, a level exactly yeah. so what we're doing is yeah we're not doing that anymore we'll just have as we unlock it'll be the traditional uh bonus stuff that'll be thrown into the certain level whatever that level is going to be kind of thing perfect but we'll have uh, you know i know that this is probably going to be the entry if you do want to move into Shanty Town, if we got a deal for you, unpainted, it's gonna be like fifteen dollars. Right. So anybody who wants to get in can afford to get in. 
And then because if you get the unpainted versions, <laughs> and even everything's going to be a two to three hundred dollars. I imagine they're going to be very expensive yeah, for an unpainted set. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then, we're talking thirty-five pieces, two to three hundred dollars. Well, with all the little accessories yeah. and furniture yeah. and whatnot, yeah. Yeah. So it's and just it is only shanty town. Painting it is should be relaxing. Yeah, that should be. Oh, uh, black we, prime it and just yeah, dry brush go. and go. Yeah, yeah. Well, whatever, man. Call it done. Well, unless you're adding all the graffiti and everything else to well, it. Well, even graffiti is easy because if you mess it up, you just paint over it with more graffiti. That's very true. And leave it peeking through. Yeah, that's very true. I didn't even think about it that no, way. <laughs> It did not take me very long to. I'm not a. I'm not a real life graffitiist, so I was on the internet looking at some uh, how-to graffiti, in, you know, full size uh, sites, and then you just start painting, and you go, well, yeah, that's all right, and you find some stuff, and you just mimic it. I mean, most of it's illegible anyway, so you don't have to copy it slavishly. You just right. copy it the best you can if it looks kind of like it. That's okay. Yeah, that's very true. So with that, are you going to be putting out new stuff? I know you partnered with somebody to make a well. Not so much for you guys to make a war game bull set, but called Skirmish Sangat. Yeah, we did. We did Skirmish Africa with. Um, um, Phalanx. Phalanx. Well, it's not failing. Yeah, uh, out of New Zealand, and they are a fabulous com company to work with, and uh, they were very gracious, and it was a lot of fun working with them. Um, so those are available. Skirmish Sangat, Skirmish Africa is where we can. Skirmish Africa was where he made an imaginary Africa with all these new countries in it. And broke down what type of armies they would have and all that kind of stuff and the equipment they would have. And uh, he did a fa fabulous, fabulous job with it. Nice. Um, I don't want to be a rules company. We sell you what you need to run your game. So, for example, our, our buildings are non rule specific, very much so. And if you want to use them, for, you know, like our Middle Eastern buildings, if you want to use them for Mexico, go ahead. You want to use them for Star Wars Tatooine? Go ahead. Right. <laughs> but uh, even our modern figures, I don't really care if you want to, whatever rules you're comfortable with, there's several out there right now. And uh, I'm just more and more excited. I'm, I'm really getting into the modern stuff. I like it. It's, uh, it appeals to me, and there's just more and more neat things out there. It's very, it is very much an untapped market because of the fact that I think a lot of people, they want – they kind of want the Call of Duty or the Battlefield experience on a tabletop. Yep. And there's so many companies out there that they're afraid to, at least from what I've seen anyway, and listeners, if you know of anybody, please you know, make some comments on this, but it seems like they're, they either go far too simulationist to the point to where you're almost counting bullets in every M16 that you have on the field, or they they freeform it so much that it's like at the end of the day, you're like, well, I can make a force, but really like my U S force is no different than your op four, you know? So that's one of those things where it's like, what's the difference between an M16 and an AK 47? Well, you know, what, what's the difference between a nine millimeter pistol and a 45? And, you know, they, they want, a, they, they want the variance, but they don't want simulationist rules, which I think is where yeah. the tough part of that comes in. We have a, a set of convention rules that we run. And it's very quick and easy. Uh, we can run mass combat because typically we'll have four different players or four different teams with two, maybe three players on each team sometime. And we, we're fielding each team is probably running 40 to 50 miniatures kind of thing on our big gaming boards. Wow. And um, it's quick enough where everybody's picking it up after the first round and they can kind of do it themselves. Because a convention game, you got to do that. Yeah. You know, it's it's – it's got to be fluid. It's got to be fast. Got to got to keep you going to to be a convention game. It's not rules. Lawyers would hate it <laughs> because basically, I don't know. Roll and see if you can do it. <laughs> Isn't it like that for every game though? Should How am I going to do this? I don't know. Roll roll well enough. I guess you can do it. Yeah. So uh, again, I I really don't want to sell rules. I want to do modern stuff. We're coming out with the vehicles. The miniatures, we're going to be doing more miniatures as we go along. Uh, for Shantytown, we're going to have a set of checkpoint police we're working on right now, which are going to be not very, not very good. I mean, it's Shantytown, so they're going to be like, you know, your pot belly middle-aged guy balding kind of with a pistol <laughs> in, his, in his belt he's kind of stuck in there, kind of stopping police, you know, with that look. And his buddy's going to be some skinny guy with his bray on 
all messed up. And his AK's on his back, and he's looking at his cell phone. <laughs> his clothes are too baggy. He's kind of hanging off of him. And another guy's going to be sunglasses, going to be hanging around with a shotgun. So I think, you know, we're going to do some fun sets like that. You just described Kuwaiti police. <laughs> you just described the Kuwaiti police. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and those could be used for a checkpoint. They could be used for gu- guarding buildings. There'll be a lot of uses for those kind of figures. It'll be a lot of fun. Nice, nice. So, it, do, how many figures do you have planned? Because I know right now for the United the United States, you have I think it's twelve figures, and then no, the opposing got, forces is got, six or seven. We got. Um, I might be again. I'm probably wrong on that, but just after the initial. Look we got that. enough for the Americans to make a platoon. Okay. So we got. Two versions of the nine-man squad, the four-man uh, platoon headquarters, and then you got um, two-man uh, machine gun team, 240 Bravo, and your two-man uh, javelin missile team. So we got all that, and then our bag, and then we got a new ammo bearer we just came out with too, which I'm going to swap out on the 240 guy. And then for the opposing force guys, it's ten, and we got a new alternate uh, leader pose with a machete, uh, which is kind of nice. Nice. Um, so we're going to be adding to those with, it's just really, Bobby, is, I don't know if you know Bobby Jackson, but he's extremely busy with Reaper. <laughs> they pretty much own him. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Love Bobby, and he's awesome, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's hard for him to do some other projects right now, so we're hoping uh, to get these going, and then as the summer comes around, we'll get some more uh, figure packs going as well on those. Uh, but in addition to those, well, I mean, we really got into figures the last couple of years. We have our own town folks for the medieval. For the medieval, it's about a dozen. Yeah, after this, uh, with the new Kickstarter coming yeah, in, we yeah, close to a dozen nice. things. And then we have our own farm animals. Well, I got so some alive, of... some dead. Uh, yes. yes. Well, we just had the dead donkey, uh, and that was done up as a possibility for when we're doing modders for IEDs. Uh, but uh, so many people have asked for farm animals out there. There wasn't a whole lot of choice. So those are going to con- those like are going to continue, and those are really nice um, Kickstarter bonus things you can do. You know, add them in the figures because it gives you some some neat things to add and spice up your village or your town or whatever. But to be honest, they're, they're not that expensive, so you can afford to do this in add-ons. Right. You know, watch your watch your, your budget. I don't want to get into a situation on Kickstarter where, like some of these companies have, where they pledge more than they made. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen quite a few companies that pull stuff like that off. You just can't do that. Yeah, I can't. Uh, you know, there's there's quite a few off the top head Kingdom Death that I I kind of know of where it's like, um, you know, you, that's that's a paycheck. You know, that yeah. comes back to it at the end of the day. So it's, it's a, uh, it gets a little crazy sometimes. I mean, Jim works really hard on putting these together, and um, then there's a whole back end on doing all the the painting that she does too and then photography and the putting together the the packages on a kickstarter so it's it's a lot of work i enjoy it but uh yeah so you got to really watch all your numbers when you do these kind of oh yeah things. yeah kickstarter you can definitely paint yourself into a corner yeah yeah it's it I've, I've had people describe it to me as like the greatest yet most terrifying and taxing 30 days you will ever live in your life <laughs> ours aren't that bad because i mean we're running what was ours like? We only had 62 people in our last Kickstarter. I mean, we still funded, and so that one still did right. well. But um, it's not like some <laughs> of these big companies where they have 10,000 backers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, I, I just I know that from Simon when I was working yeah. there. I mean, Zombicide season three, 13 and a half thousand backers, just like that. I was like, um, and I gotta unload these containers and ship them all up myself, don't I? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Is there anything else you guys want me to do while I'm at it? <laughs> yeah. No, that was uh, that was the fun part because Jim got out of the biggest Kickstarter we have was the first one, the Castle Two Kickstarter, and that was a 53 foot extra tall container. Right. And um, I asked my our business partner is in Florida. He manages our warehouse out of Florida. The water. I was very specific that I wanted two blondes that could, you know, pretty good size so they could lift the boxes and then give some massages afterwards. And I show up and he's got a friend with a bad back and two 50 year old cousins to help out. And I'm like, 
So the opposite of what you wanted in the first place. I'm like, I left you really simple instructions. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So your your warehouse is actually in Clearwater. Yeah. yeah. Really, that's kind of funny because my wife and I were just down there a few weeks ago. I lived down there for ten years. Oh yeah, it's off uh, high off uh, nineteen. Really. The main drag, yeah. Hmm. What what's it near? Um, it's a little bit down the street from the mall. Oh, just okay. north of the mall. Okay. Sunset gotcha. is it Sunset? I think it's off of Sunset or something down in that area. Yeah, Sunset Point. Yeah. It's not much. It's a warehouse. Well, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you gotta have some place to store them, and uh, it's it's worked out pretty well. But uh, yeah, Perry Perry owns a comic sports card shop, and uh, he was the financial guy when he had hit it big with Pokemon, and uh, was looking for something to invest in. And then he ships out every day, so he really understands. Shipping to countries, what size boxes you can ship to which countries, and how the costs, and uh, kind of monitoring all that. It's really been a big help. Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. So as far as anything anything else you could tell us about the upcoming Kickstarter, I know that you said you got about 35 items. Is there anything that you haven't really announced anyone yet that you wouldn't mind, like, spilling a little bit of beans on? or I don't know. Anything that stands up to you is particularly cool? The Garage Mechanic Shop is going to be very cool it's got junk piled all the way around it it comes with a set of tools including what's that the little uh, torch there's yeah. a settling torch and the roll around mechanics tools on a workbench and yeah um, a couple other things like three or four things in it. Nice. so yeah m most of the buildings like the clinic comes with the medical exam furniture the police station comes with the government office furniture so most of the buildings come with a furniture accessory set, which is also sold individually. Oh. Uh, like the warehouse comes uh, either with, uh, for, it has available warehouse inventory stacks, and, or um, if you're going to use it as a dive bar, and we make accessories to turn the outside of it into a, a outdoor patio seated area, um, then we we have uh, we have tables and chairs and bar sets and all that stuff already. But we now have pool tables, pinball machines, um, jukebox, jukebox, and my screen's TV used to stick on the wall. So the one thing I got to ask, because you're still talking about kind of doing it as like a warehouse converted into a dive bar, are any of your pub tables going to be the spool? You know, the big like electrical cable yeah. spools? Could. Well, we have to. Not, that, not this release. Oh, no. okay, fine. Now we I'll, did put on, I'll put on the list. Tim. Now we did do a static <laughs> with a, like a four We do have street four. furniture. It's an old sofa that's. That it is, it's a nasty old sofa, and it's it's shorter on one end and all that stuff. And then there's a table that's made of a piece of plywood on a stack of tires, and it comes with some other equals, or yeah. plastic chairs. Uh, yeah. So just furniture out in the street, kind of stuff. Nice. Um, oh, the, I think though the other piece that we haven't talked about yet that's going to be probably my favorite is the bodega. Yes. That's going to be really cool because that has both uh, a complete interior. With uh, shelves reaching coolers, a counter, uh, the rack of cigarettes, and condoms on. behind the counter. Yeah, <laughs> and then on the outside, it's got uh, Jim did these beautiful shelves of uh, counterfeit, counterfeit handbags and knockoff Nikes and DVDs, DVDs and, and fruit and you know just stuff. Um, when you when you look at uh, market areas and uh, not necessarily in the third world, but it just in heavily congested areas, the outside the front door of the shop is just racks and racks of stuff. So we've made a, a couple of those, a couple of racks and racks of stuff to put right outside the door of the bodega. And Jim's going to be, I can't wait to see all the graffiti that's going to be on right, that one too. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we even have some uh, older stuff that's going to be nice from our uh, direct line. We had, uh, we had a, a convenience store and we did an, three interior sets for it and an exterior set and that exterior set had the ice machine um it had a soft drink machine yeah the rack with the propane cans in it and the uh, little box with the uh, apartment finder catalog so we're going to start taking those and putting them up against some of the buildings and especially some of the uh, soft drink machines we'll put several of those on nice yeah it's those little things i don't know how you are but it's those little things accessories that just really make the gaming table come to life yeah, especially when you're talking like more of a, a modern style game, 
or even near future, if you want to go that route, where yeah. um, because we see it every day in real life that if you don't have like just that little bit of extra character, after a while, it, it doesn't really look real. It looks like it's almost too clean. Like n even if you put bullet holes in the side of a building and whatnot, yeah. it doesn't look like anybody lives there. Nope. Right. And you you want you want a lot of your terrain. At least I do because I'm, oh, I'm I'm a terrain yeah. snob when it comes time to that. I want my terrain to make sense for the game that I'm playing. Also, the more detail and clutter and stuff, whether you're playing a World War II game or even really a fantasy game, um, that you have uh, in scenery on the table, it will cause the players to start using that in the games in ways that maybe the rules don't actually anticipate. You know, taking shelter behind this or or, or throwing furniture out in the way to, you know, to, to uh, <laughs> form an obstacle and things like that. But if it's not there, then you don't have that kind of stuff going on. Right. And that kind of stuff can make, uh, can make the game immensely more fun. As a game master, uh, laying out my tables, uh, this was at Gen Con. Um, somebody walked by, I was essentially doing Iraq with all Middle Eastern and just, we throw sand and dirt and just stuff everywhere. And a guy walked by and goes, that looks like a really nasty place. I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jim wants to take a, like stink bombs and have them set off every now and then yeah. just so you get the full experience. Yeah, just subtle. Come up, <laughs> what smells like falafel and goat cheese? What just happened here? Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. So what, what, currently, what are you guys playing? I know, obviously, you, you're creating all this terrain. You can't tell me you're not playing any. any at the moment. I absolutely can tell you I don't play any games. You don't play any games. I'm not, I don't play games at all. How dare you? I, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I retired from gaming about 30 years ago. Uh, I play some Pathfinder about once a month with a group and um, the new game master, the, the current game master has been, I'm going to rat him out, he's just been awful. I mean, we play <laughs> at my house and, and there are shelves with the buildings and I have about 20 plus boxes of Dwarven Forge train and he rolls out his mat draws it and it just it drives me insane so i told the new game master has taken over that that's unacceptable <clears throat> i don't understand that like i can't knowing fathom. your company and you have the dwarven oh, forge it drives me the, crazy Absolutely the only thing i could see crazy. the map for was if he just had to draw it out real quick and then put the buildings on it just so he remembers what the hell he was doing. so that's going to change because i'm tired of it um <laughs> But I do, so I do Pathfinder. I play uh, Ancients about once a year, twice a year. I have a Roman army. And then I do Moderns, mainly running Moderns because I'm promoting and getting everybody excited about stuff. So I'll run here in town. I'm trying to run it once a quarter at the different game stores. Um, and then at the conventions, what it comes down to. I mean, we do a big, big layout at Gen Con and Historicon. We have two tables. Um, like the medieval table, how long is that one? It's 24 feet long. Oh, wow. 24 feet long, and then one end is Castle on a Hill. And the other end is a village. And we got people playing anywhere from historical, true historicals, Henry V, you know, uh, 100 Years of War, Warhammer, yeah. Napoleonics, World War II, all that to Gnome Wars <laughs> on <laughs> that table. Game of Thrones games will be big this year on this yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. And then we, uh, I set up a full Middle Eastern table next to it. And so the game masters love it because all we got to do is bring the figures. Yeah. Absolutely. And the rules and whatever dice they need kind of thing. So if for a big trip, it really saves them on uh, packing. And uh, so I'll set up a Middle Eastern and we'll run, um, gosh, uh, we're Black Hawk Down on that scenario. There's, there's usually that. There's usually some zombie wars. Yeah. Zombie games going on. Um, um, war against ISIS kind of stuff. Yeah. They're in a town. Things like that. So Nice. Different game masters. I mean, they just... Uh, I, I, I make it available and they sign up and I, I trust them not to run anything objectionable. They're all experienced guys. And so fine, you get that two o'clock time slot. Nice. So as far as like your homebrew rules that you guys normally run, yep. who, how did you come about those? Um, I know you said you're not a rules guy, but they had to come from somewhere. Uh, Michael Johns wrote those rules. He had been using them and tweaking them for several years. He's a longtime hardcore 40K player. And he just got tired of all the changes. And so he was really working on a set. He calls it open conflict. And he was working on a set of near future rules. And so when we approached him that we wanted to do some convention games, he started tweaking them for moderns. And um, now it's just, it's a really nice set of uh, 
convention rules where I can have, you know, kids playing to adults and it's, it's a quality of troop kind of game. So it's D12, low is good. Uh, like Americans, we make sevens. And um, so you roll, you know, number of guys in your squad. Plus, if you have any weapons, you get up to 12 dice. You roll versus your opponent. And then if you have more successes than them, you kill guys. If not, then nothing happens. Kind of thing. You get extra dice. It's all about extra dice. So okay. uh, on the defensive, there's two types of body armor. Are you behind cover? Are you in the open? It determines how many dice you have, how many guys you started with kind of thing. Um, you know, it's pretty much uh, each team goes and you roll an initiative at the beginning of each round. And then to kind of get the fog of war, because we'll have uh, a lot of civilians and civilian vehicles and everything on the table as well. Everybody takes a direction die in a D12 and you just kind of move everything. And so what will happen is like the Americans are getting ready to shoot on somebody in the next round. All of a sudden some civilians moved in the way. Rules Ooh. of engagement say you can't shoot through civilians. That guy's don't have those rules of engagement. Right, I was going to say, they're just going to do what they want to do. <laughs> so it, it really changes the battlefield. And a lot of times uh, uh, with the game master, the, uh, the insurgents will come up to me and say, hey, we're going to take this vehicle and we're going to try to ram at the front gate and use one of our IEDs. I said, okay. So they'll start slowly moving to make sure nobody sees them and stuff like that. <laughs> start off slow, and then they just yeah. speed up when they get it. Yeah, it, it gets crazy. Wow. Um, it's a lot of fun, and everybody, it's a mission based game. So, what I will do is, you know, uh, for example, we usually have a, an American force, then we have a uh, government force. We play in what we call a bungalow. We stole Bungalesia from AK 47 rules. So it's, uh, it's kind of the Horn of Africa, so you get that kind of thing going on. So you'll have uh, the Bengalesian government, their police, their army, and they have some contractors. And they got to protect the palace, the police station, the uh, the port. And then they also have to go out and do things. And so we have a Shia insurgency, and we got a Sunni insurgency going on. So you got all these different missions and the interaction of people trying to get things done. Um, and it makes a really interesting game and watch gamers forget what their missions are because <laughs> <laughs> like I never make the Americans almost I'd say never, but most of the time I don't make the Americans a target. They're going doing key leader and gaming support mission in this country and insurgents can't help themselves. They go, Oh, I want to attack the Americans. <laughs> it's not one of your missions, but okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, ultimately I'm just here to run the game. It's you that's deciding what they do. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny how people will not stay focused on things. And the other thing is, I don't know if you played, you probably played convention games. It's, it's a four hour game. Yeah. So you can't sit back and say, well, I'm going to see what he's going to do before I do anything. No. There's no time. No. You got to go and you got to take it by the horns and you just go for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's amazing. Most gamers won't do that. It just boggles my mind. So what I've had to do is I, I, I you know, before I said, you got to move over here. And now I say, you guys are right across the street from each other and you're in combat. <laughs> Go. Uh, 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 shoot. <laughs> Start there. Yeah. Uh, but just game master stuff. It's, you know, we got helicopters. We'll bring it. If it gets really bad, the Americans have an actual AC-130 gunship that they can bring in. Hoorah. Jim's son had a, a We model. had one laying around in the basement from my kids' youth, and I measured it out and went, that's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> so he had all the guns to it and stuff. So you just like hang it on a string and just like bring you know, it up. We just kind of fly it around. When yeah, it starts like really a player bad, walks around with it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Jim made a Reaper drone with like six Hellfires on it. Oh. <laughs> so they got some options if it gets bad. And it's gotten bad. Um, some people just don't have any luck with dice. <laughs> it depends on the games. Like I, I've got games where I do really well, and I got games where I'm just like, and I'm gonna get murdered, and it's yeah. not gonna be because of strategy. It's just because my dice beat me. Yeah. Oh yeah. But uh, it, it's fun because it keeps it simple. So you're you're not so worried about the rules as you are about having fun. Yeah. Kind of. And I'm the kind of guy I want to play with all my toys. Yeah. If if you're gonna take the time to paint them all, and you're gonna take the time to collect them all, you definitely want to just. You, you want to use them as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. You don't ever want to have them just one and done. So, 
that's that's how the game works and that's where we use it and um you know people when they buy the figures too we'll give them a free set of rules on the website for that too nice so as far as that goes you guys mentioned you're at a lot of conventions what conventions do you have scheduled for yourselves this year uh well in the middle of july we go to historicon Fredericksburg, Virginia. That's yeah. a historical gaming convention. In the middle of August, we do Gen Con, which is general gaming of all kinds. Right. 60,000 people in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. Uh, wonderful convention as a gamer. It's hell on wheels if you're a, if you're a vendor. <laughs> it's as a vendor, it's that. probably the worst show you do as yeah. far as stress-wise. That's right. That's right. Uh, then we will do um, Buracon in September in Orlando. And back to uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. No, 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 you forgot ReaperCon. Oh, October. yeah, yeah. We tend to go to ReaperCon in Dallas in the middle of October. And then uh, early November, we'll be up in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania at Fall in Historical nice. Convention. Yeah. Uh, the big one for us this year was Adepticon. We had not been back to Adepticon in probably 10 but, years. Yeah, about 10 years. And it's they've really done a great job with that convention. Just fabulous. It, there were close to probably 6,000 miniature gamers. I would think that would be about right. You can't find that anywhere else. No, you, you can't. Um, it's funny. I was actually mentioning to Nick, and we talked about it a little bit while we were there at the show and even on our kind of uh, Adepticon recap that we did for the podcast. And I, I told him it, it, it has changed drastically over the course of even two years of how, of how the convention itself has restructured itself. Uh, they're bringing in more board games now, which I was actually surprised to see um, in a good way. And uh, I'm just waiting for that one time where someone's going to sneak in there with that RPG. And next thing you know, we're going to start seeing that as a convention where it's, yes, it's going to be a miniatures focused convention because that's always what it's been. But then we're going to have like small board game pockets here and there. And we're also going to have like an RPG night, like one night we'll have dedicated to that. I see it happening some point in the future. Yeah. Um, it may be a few years, but I've already I've already started seeing it move drastically in that direction just from the the newness and the way that they handled a lot of the even the vendors this year because it used to be the vendors they kind of tucked back in that corner right. off to the side and you always had that din of 40k and listeners if yeah. you've been to Adepticon you know what I'm talking about where they always put 40k in that big gymnasium style room and you just get that din all day long so even as a, a vendor there. You can't even hear yourself think half the time because all you're hearing is just that din and someone's asking you a question, yep. and they're you know they're hearing the same thing. And if you're not on the same page right away, it's kind of I don't want to say it's a lost sale, but it's it's a lot harder to get people excited in your product when there was all that going on at once. So this year, I know that they kind of opened up both sides, and yeah, we all the vendors were stuck in the middle, but even this year, I didn't notice that din. I mean, yeah, you had 40k going on. And you could hear it, but it wasn't that same. No, it wasn't. Booming. It wasn't oppressive. No, yeah, no, we were very happy with the show, and uh, it's going to have to be in the rotation. It's it's a force to be dealt with. Yeah. Um, and what do you have? Like eighty vendors this year? I don't know. It was I a think lot of vendors. Sort of yeah, it's eighty. I think so. I think two or three years ago, when um, I started going, when I was still with Pumani or not, they had twenty. Yeah. yeah. So it's. And he's doing a great job of defending his con with the type of vendors he wants there so he doesn't get too many of a, of a certain kind of thing going on right so, absolutely um they, plus chicago's got some great food <laughs> yeah you definitely can't go wrong with the, the food <laughs> when you're vending it's all about the food <laughs> <laughs> yeah awesome well guys is there anything else you want to talk about uh before we wrap up the podcast I, don't know I think that's it. We appreciate you letting us come in and uh, talk about us and uh, promote our new stuff coming out. Like I said, the uh, Shanty Towns, the next Kickstarter will be out this summer. And, uh, if you're into those kind of things, give us a try. Fantastic. Well, guys, I got to thank you so much for coming over to the right, house tonight and uh, bearing with my dogs that like to jump all over and lick your legs. Well, I get to go through it again when I get home. Yeah, right? well, there you go. So I just I helped you with that a little bit. <laughs> Nick, is there anything else you want to throw in there before we go? Oh, no. Okay. So. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this episode of Skirmish Supremacy. We will see you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. To see more of the antics that Nick and I do, you can check us out on Facebook at Skirmish Supremacy. 
We also have Twitter, which we can be reached at Skirmish Supreme, because apparently Skirmish Supremacy does not fit in Twitter. And if you want to email us directly, you can reach us at Tim at SkirmishSupremacy.com or Nick at SkirmishSupremacy.com. Thanks for listening.